My name is Rachel. I work at the University of Nottingham. I currently direct the Centre for Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine, and our CVS Knowledge kindly asked me to talk about this. I think because I stuck my neck out at Windsor at the meeting a year ago. Um, but I'm going to give you my interpretation of um, not being hoodwinked by sales patter. I nicked this phrase from one of my final year vet students who got horribly crossed during evidence-based veterinary medicine teaching that she could be conned by anybody within our profession or out with our profession trying to sell her something. So, some of you might be looking at me and wondering what on earth it is I'm drinking. <laughs> okay, what I'm drinking is something called... Martin, there's a seat at the front just for you. It's called Smart Water what's in this bottle. It's actually not, I've drunk the smart water. This is out of the disabled toilet downstairs. Um, but the reason it's smart is because it's made that way, okay? And I think we're all probably made in a smart way, but the reason I've got this today is it's my favorite bit of sales stuff that I've had recently. I don't know whether if I drink it, I'm smart, or whether I'm smart if I buy it, I don't know what it is. Um, but if it makes me smart, then that's helpful. The reason I bought it was it was the cheapest one in the shop, okay? <laughs> The rest of you that weren't wondering that might be wondering what on earth it is I'm wearing. Oh no, I've dropped something. What I have with me is everything in the last two months that somebody has tried to give me, sell to me, bribe me, don't know what it is, either by reading the vet record, the vet times, asking me to speak, asking me to do things. So we have some pet plus for cats, some paper, Offered a scuba diving holiday. Nice. There you go. Nice. Set of headphones. I want some of these things back. They don't all belong to me because I clearly didn't say yes. I trust the president with my iPad. <laughs> We're constantly offered iPads at the moment, and um, I think the whole of the profession probably has one. But if you haven't, you probably need a thermo cup because we've got lots of those as well. I do need that back. That belongs to my husband. And then sometimes there's random bits of stationery, bit of sellotape from Bayer. <laughs> And um, you can pass them along. But we're given loads of stuff all the time. And it can all look right. You can keep the mug. I've got loads of them. <laughs> and keep passing them along. Some of it's my marketing material, if anybody in the room is worried. <laughs> but all of the time, we're given stuff. We're sold stuff. Whether that's within our profession. <laughs> Have some stuff. I don't want to take it home again. You want some stuff? You want some stuff? Please take some stuff. Yeah. We're given it all of the time. And really what we need to do when we're faced with sales patter, this was a ski holiday by the way, that was another option, small child, never going to be able to say yes. I knit this from a friend in industry who left it behind. But what you need to do, <laughs> he's a very good friend, there's a picture of him in a minute. Um, what you need to do when you see all that stuff, whoever's selling it to you, whether it be pharmaceutical industry, nutrition companies, a referral company, a diagnostic test company, the RCBS, Centre for Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine, is be able to see through all of that pretty stuff, all of that junk, and have a look beneath it and see what the basic plain science is. I wore sparkly shoes because I can't ever totally wear black. But a lot of the time there is something that's really the little gem inside, and it's your job, whoever you are, whatever kind of person you are, when somebody's selling you something, you've got to look through all the crap and see where the good stuff is. And that's what you should base your decisions on. To be good evidence-based, particularly when I'm talking about sales patter, um, these are the people that currently support the research that I'm involved with. So it's a mixture of pharmaceutical industry, RCBS knowledge, other charities, and big um, research grant awarding people as well, as well as the University of Nottingham. So that's how I contact with some people that sell some kind of product. I also do training with and for a number of different companies, whether they be diagnostic companies, journals, referral institutions, primary care practices, all of you sell something. Sadly, I'm currently pet free. Oh, my 20, sorry. I do have a child, he's not a pet. I, I have worked that out. But I am currently pet free. The great old Toby Dean was finally put to sleep last year. So I'm currently not in the market to buy anything to do with animals, much to my husband's relief. I also don't own a vet clinic, but I do try and scab free stuff for my teaching and also for a clinic that I run with Dr. Jenny Stavisky called Vets in the Community in Nottingham. So that's how I interact at the moment with various different people that might sell me something. 
I also have good friends in the industry um, and have done for a very long period of time. <laughs> She's just realized where she is. Um, I didn't know she was here. This is me. This is my favorite kind of photo, okay? I went as Beauty and the Beast. <coughs> you may recognize Callum Blair, um, who currently works for Marielle, who I've known for a really long time. So I have friends that work in all parts of our profession that might be selling something to you, whatever you do within your job. If you want to do a bit of um, light, but not quite so light as bad science, but this is a book called Bad Pharma, where they talk about the relationship, where he talks about the relationship, which is quite bad, between the pharmaceutical industry and the medical profession. I think we need to be careful not to go that far, um, because I think a lot of the time at the moment, if we're just thinking about the pharmaceutical industry that sells to us in veterinary medicine, some of the relationships can be really good. What we can potentially do is a smaller profession where money isn't as bigger currency as it is in the medical profession, we can maybe get to the point where we're best pharma. Um, I bastardize everybody's adverts all of the time, so get ready for it. But um, what I put this up is because often, I think when people told me I was going to do this talk, they thought this was going to be about bashing people that sell us drugs. It's definitely not. So the people in the room who I can see that are involved in that industry, breathe. Breathe. Okay, this is a good environment. It's all about building good relationships. But I'm also going to talk about other things that are sold to us, and some of them are more scientifically based than others. So this is kind of what I'm going to go through in the next half an hour or so. So what is being sold to us? Why is it being sold? And sometimes that's not always clear. How is it being sold? And I've just demonstrated one of the ways. And then some very simple top tips that you can remember when you're looking at anything that anybody's trying to sell you. So if we think about, as a veterinary profession, as well as the vet nursing <coughs> profession, I count you too, if we think about what is being sold, sometimes it's an idea, okay? I'm trying to sell you an idea right now across this 40-minute lecture. It might be a service, it might be a test, it might be a treatment, or it might be something else. There's actually quite a lot of other things that are sold to us each and every day, including things like smart water. So what kind of ideas? Well, right now, the whole of today is about selling you this idea, that we do love evidence and that is what we want. I spend a lot of my time trying to convince people of the idea that evidence-based veterinary medicine is a good thing and the way forward. Equally, somebody might be... People just keep coming. Keep, oh, you've got a chair. Fantastic. Um, there are lots of ideas out there, and what we're focusing on today is the idea of evidence-based veterinary medicine. I can make a pre pretty good sell of it, and I hope everybody else here today is already passionate about this. But you might be a sceptic or a cynic in the room that is here just so you've got better fuel for your argument for talking about how we can make decisions in different ways. I've been to lots of different conferences, members of lots of different communities and associations, but they are full of different ideas and ways that they think we should move forward with the profession. And you have to remember all of the time that it's an idea, it might be the truth, it might not be the truth, um, but we've got to get a little bit more critical and evidence-based about the way we approach these things. So, some people get quite extreme with their ideas and start looking into the future. So this says, whatever the future may look like, advocate is intended to keep us leading the way. May or may not be true. If you're in doubt, this is what advocate thinks the future looks like. A bit of a strange place if you're a cat, which is what uh, my patient of interest is. But there's often ideas in lots of different things that we see. Sometimes people are selling us a service. And you'll notice all of the marketing material I've got here is not taken beautifully from the companies or organizations that I asked for. Everything here is photographed out of the vet record and the vet times out of the last two weeks. That's not because I'm lazy and I didn't organize my talk. I was just making sure things were current. So I haven't involved anybody else in writing this talk. Um, but we are also sold these kinds of services. So these are two um, referral practices that are con uh, currently advertising in the vet records, and they're selling us a service. How would you choose between Northeast Veterinary uh, Referrals and Northwest Surgeons other than a Northeast Divide? Does anybody work at either of these? No, okay. Well, I didn't use some advertising anyway, if you do. Sometimes we're sold tests, and those tests can really vary. So it could be something like this, which is VaxiCheck, which is a test you can do as an alternative to necessarily routinely giving <laughs> annual vaccinations. No test is perfect either. You can be e equally critical around testing as you can around ideas and products that you buy. This interestingly fell through my door um, two weeks ago from Dick White Referrals, from the lovely Johnny Ray, who is a great um, internal medic and cardiologist, offering a screening panel for cats with murmurs. Um, really interesting, good to look at it, 
great teaching material, would you refer all your cats for this or not? You can look at the evidence base and you can make a decision. It's all shiny, it's nice, great clinician, is it the right thing to do? You need to question that. And of course I can't avoid treatments in these talks, but there are loads of different um, products given to us all of the time. The previous speaker was just talking about that. Do we need to focus on the evidence behind new products or do we need to focus on the evidence behind old products? I think we probably need to look at everything. That is a big task, so we have to pick our evidence battles. We sold lots of other things as well. Um, some people would put these under treatment as well. Some people put them under management. But all of the time, these things are put in our face with varying degrees of evidence behind them. So what I would do first is when you're looking at something, I was thirsty. That's why I bought smart water, not because I think it's going to make me cleverer, but hopefully it will. But you need to think whenever you're looking at something or somebody's offering you something is why is it being sold? Because we all have our own responsibilities to our own jobs, our own companies, our own associations that we work in. But what is it um, that is the reasoning behind somebody trying to get us to use or buy this service or product? Is it better? Is it because it's easier? Just because something is easy, is that the right thing to do? I wouldn't do this job if it was just because it was easy, because it's not. Um, is it just a new application for a new species? Is that appropriate? Do we need it in that species or have we just got it because um, it was an easy thing for whoever to develop? Or is there another reason why it's being sold? So sometimes when you read adverts, you can't always be clear what it is that you're looking at, but the one on the um, left-hand side as you look at it, the word that seems to stick out to me, and I know nothing about calf pneumonia, um, is fast. So they're suggesting that this is a faster way of treating calf pneumonia. The word here is broader. So they're now suggesting this does more than this used to do or more than other products do. Is that better? That's better if you need that broad spectrum, but if you don't, do you need that product? Easier. Now, as a feline medicine specialist, there is the Easy to Give campaign, um, which is awesome because it's enabled us to massively increase the amount of medications, not only available to cats, but also to give to cats. But again, um, it comes up in feline medications, it comes up in canine medications. Um, how difficult is it to put down drops in dogs' ears most of the time? Probably not very difficult, but in some situations it can be very difficult. So it's good to have a new product that you can apply differently. Does that mean we need to do it in every dog with sore ears? That's the decision that the clinician has to make once you've got that drug in your hands. As I mentioned before, sometimes it's a new species. Um, as I say, I'm not picking on companies. This is just what's in Martin's rag in the last week or so, um, or in the uh, Vet Times. But this is now saying that this particular formation of Bachel is now licensed um, for sheep and goats. And if in doubt, these are sheep and goats at the bottom. It's always good when an advert helps you along. Um, it might be that there's another idea or another way of using something that is being um, sought. And I know absolutely nothing about horses, so forgive me, I think Celia's in the room. But this is something that I found um, to make sure I covered all species. But the message that's coming to me, and I know nothing about wound healing in horses, is that this is a new vet-only approach to wound healing. Okay, that might be a very useful thing. Why do we need that? I have no idea because this isn't my area. But that seems to be one of the selling points um, for this pro uh, preparation. So it's good that we've got new stuff. It's good that we're getting lots more choice in many different areas, whether it be referral, what you choose to re read your scientific information is, where you choose to buy your drugs or, or other products. So it's good, but you need to know as everything new comes onto the market or a new idea is being sold to you, um, why that is, because it might not be the reason why you want to use it. So if we think about how is something being sold, um, sometimes it's expert opinion, sometimes it's bribery, and hopefully more and more of it was because the evidence would suggest that this is the better thing to do. So we have expert opinion. Some experts are better than others. This is clearly a dead cat, but I'm trying anyway. Um, but experts can be very powerful. I'm trying to be one vaguely at the moment about evidence-based veterinary medicine. But generally our experience as um, specialist clinicians is very different from the experience that you have in primary care practice. So what might be useful in my clinic might be very different if you're working in a cat shelter somewhere. But expert opinion is often how ideas are, or products or many other things are sold. Then, of course, whoever's got my kidney sellotape has to give it back, okay? I didn't give anybody my cow because, he, well, bull, he's my favourite. But we are um, given lots of stuff all the time. Is this bribery? 
I don't know, but I always take it, okay? <laughs> My favourite bit, I don't think I gave anybody this Kit Kat, but I have to admit, a Kit Kat arrived in the post, attached to some um, marketing material. I ate the Kit Kat and didn't even know what the product was. <laughs> so I had to turn to Marnie, who I share an office with, and say, who, who did that? And the lovely Rob Lucy from Bow Ringer said, yeah, I'll send you loads more Kit Kats, that's fine. Um, so <laughs> what is this about? I think this is a good thing. There are some definite <laughs> perks. Um, for us as individuals, but what we need to be careful is that that doesn't override what the message is that's being given to us. Evidence would be my favourite thing of how people try to sell us things, but depending on what your experiences are, that's not always the case. And I'm going to focus the rest of the talk more around the evidence that is given to us and potentially how we can deal with some of that and cut all the, the snorkelling mask and the ski jacket and all the other bits and pieces and just cut it down to the pure black and white science. So the 10 top tips that I'm going to talk about are mostly to do with um, marketing literature that's come through, as I say, not all from the pharmaceutical industry, but a basic evidence-based principle is that whenever I look at something and think, is that good for teaching? Because that's generally why I look at this material, or is this bad for teaching? The questions that I ask myself and what we talk to the students about. So my first thing would be is to question things. Callum, who was in one of the pictures, um, earlier on dressed as beauty and I was his beast it was that sounds wrong as well doesn't it but anyway <laughs> anyway he's married I'm married you know make the rest up um but he, when I got this job he said I'm not surprised Rach because you've always been a cynic and I like to think I'm more of a skeptic rather than a cynic because I am an optimist at the same time but I look at something and go really this is a man that tried to sell me interferon for 10 years when I was a feline specialist and he worked at Furback. I won't tell you which cases I use it for, but we can chat about it for hours afterwards if you like. But if you just accept everything, and I did accept that Kit Kat, but what I didn't do was try and buy any of the products associated with that Kit Kat. I just ate the Kit Kat and moved on. And that is an absolutely fine thing to do. But if you are interested in something or thinking about changing your practice in any way, um, you need to question things. And that's not just because you're looking for something wrong. It's also you need to keep an open mind because there might be something really cool coming. At the homeless clinic on Wednesday, there are so many worming and flea products for cats now. And the students were all saying, which one shall I use? And I'm standing there going, I have no idea. So we got all the data sheets out and we looked. And it was great to have that choice. And we had cats of all shapes and sizes and walks of life that came into that homeless clinic. And it's brilliant to give us choice. And if we assumed every new thing coming was bad and wrong, we'd never make any headway whatsoever. So we have to remain um, open-minded about anything that comes towards us. She says trying to sell an idea that's been around for the last six years and we are going to make it all better. Um, but we have to remain open to new opportunity if we're going to improve the care of our patients. So it's good to question things. It's also good as an evidence-based clinician to think about what question you're asking so when you're asking for the evidence from whoever, you know that you get the right kind of evidence back, okay? So a lot of vets ask us, ask each other, ask people selling them stuff, something about a drug, if that's the thing of interest, is this, this treatment better than what I already use? And there's been research that shows when you ask vets what questions they have, a lot of them are either about treatment or about diagnosis. And probably this is because we, this is what we spend a lot of our decision making on in a daily clinical working life. So sometimes you might be asking about treatment. Sometimes you might be asking about a test. Sometimes you might be thinking about the risk of a disease for some reason when you're thinking about maybe using a different kind of vaccine. You might be, again, in terms of a vaccine or preventive medicine, how common is this disease? Do I need to prevent it? How common are asymptomatic murmurs? Do I need to think about them more and refer more to the lovely John Ray at Dick White Referrals? And often we get asked, we get asked this more by owners, and we do a lot of our research at Nottingham with owners as well as with vets, <coughs> farmers and companion animals alike. They want to know how long the patient will live. So if you give that treatment or you find that disease, how can we affect the longevity of the patient and also obviously their quality of life? So, fact. It's only taken me 20 minutes, but we've got to a fact at last. But here is one that what this table is telling you very simply on the left-hand side is what is your quick question about? So what are you asking yourself when you see a new product? Or what are you asking the referral surgeon that says we must do this? Or what are you saying to your lovely um, vet tech advisor from MSD because they're sitting in the corner? What are you asking them about their product? So when you say, how good is the science behind that? Or how good is this, that, or the other? Um, there are particular types of studies that best answer questions about the things on the left. 
So if you have a question about a treatment and you want to know whether this new antibiotic is faster than another one, the ideal type of study you are looking for is a randomised controlled trial. Or a cohort study will do it, it's not as good. Don't have time to go into the whys and wherefores, but there's lots of nice resources that can help you. If you've got a new test, ideally it should be a um, good, good idea, good, good picture to take this one, because um, it's got quite a lot of detail. If you want a test, you want it either compared to the gold standard or something else of a similar level on the market, and that's called a diagnostic evaluation study. Risk is a complicated beastie. So my PhD was all about risk, and does vaccination increase the risk of injection site sarcomas in cats? So I did something called one of those, a case control study. In my perfect world of evidence, I'd have done a cohort study, it would have taken me 10 years and involved 4 million cats, if I was lucky. So instead, we did the next level down, which isn't as strong as a cohort, and that's a case control study, which is a, a lot more doable. You can also do find information about risk, um, some risk factors in cross-sectional studies. <coughs> Prevalence is how common is a disease. So right now, how many people have got a cough? No one. But a minute ago, somebody over there did, which is probably about a 1% prevalence rate. Okay, incidence is something that happens over time. So if I was clever and my brain could do two things at once, I'd have counted how many people have coughed since we walked in the room, and I'd be able to tell you the prevalence, the incidence in the room over the last 20 minutes. So you need different types of studies. So if you want to know what happens over time, and often um, uh, one may lead to another, but prevalence is right here, right now. Incidence is what might happen in the future. Survival, sometimes we can measure that with cohort studies, sometimes we can do that with randomised controlled trials. I'm not suggesting you now go back and revise what all of these look like and know the ins and outs of them, but if you're starting to practice, and there's lots of vet conferences coming up, if somebody's telling you that their treatment is better, faster, whatever, you say, brilliant, can I have a randomised controlled trial? That's what I started to do at BSABA five years ago, and they all sort of turn away after a while. Give me the sellotape and walk away. Um, but... Equally, if somebody is offering you a brand new test at their referral centre, you're like, great, show me the evidence. Where's the diagnostic evaluation test study that will show me that your CT is better than my CT or whatever it might be? But it's just starting to learn the lingo. But the most important thing, don't try reading evidence until you know it's the right kind of evidence to answer your question that you are questioning with your open mind. You'll note that nowhere in there did I have a case study or a case series? We have a lot of these in veterinary medicine. And basically what they do is they tell nice stories, which is really useful clinically to have a look at other people's experience of what happens when they use a particular product, test, idea, whatever. And some of them are very compelling. So this one is a miniature uh, pincer. It's female, five years, 5.2 kilos. Before administration of this thing, it had had severe pain in the anterior legs for three years. It hates to be even touched and bit only when being t and bit when only being touched in the anterior legs. A steroid was administered when the pain was strong. After administration of this product, no dragging of legs was observed immediately after waking up. It did not hate to be touched in the anterior legs, and the condition was improved so it could run around the house. Lovely. But all it does is it tells us what happened to that dog, and it may have got up and walked the next day with or without that product because it's not being compared to anything. So case studies are nice, they tell a descriptive story and they can be really helpful as a clinician, but they don't give you any idea as to whether a treatment works or not. That doesn't mean we need a randomised control trial for everything. So at the moment we have lots of products at the moment that treat and kill all worms in puppies. So maybe we just need to demonstrate that all products are on a level and can do that. We don't necessarily need an RCT for everything. The best example is one you've probably seen before is... You wouldn't do a randomised controlled trial to see whether parachutes stop you dying when you fall out of a plane, okay? Because quite quickly you would see the people without the parachute would die and the people with the parachute would live. Ethically, it would be inappropriate to then just check with a randomised controlled trial with 10,000 patients, push 10,000 people out, randomly give 5,000 a, a parachute and hope. You don't want to do that. We have no randomised controlled trials or cohorts in any patient for the use of freezemide congestive heart failure. Somebody realised that if you give any animal in congestive heart failure freezemide, they get better. And so very quickly it becomes adopted practice, and we have those. So case studies aren't to be totally slammed, but you have to be totally aware of what they're there for. They look really pretty and they look really nice, but that doesn't mean they're right. They're telling you a story that's right for everybody. 
The other thing to think about is your patient. We are really lucky. Um, those poor medics, all they do is treat humans all the time. I mean, how boring is that? Sorry if you're in the room, Dr. Be Professor Baker. But we, we have this advantage across our profession of, of all sorts of different patients. So when we're choosing the idea or the referral or the um, treatment or the something else for our patients, um, we have to really think about whether it applies to our patient group or actually... Um, the product that's being sold or the idea that's being sold actually doesn't apply to my world. A bit like the comments I said about earlier about the world of referral medic is very different from a primary care clinician. So the kind of patients I see every day are very different from the ones you might see if you're in general practice. Because sometimes things are quite specific. I know nothing about calf pneumonia, as I've already said, presuming that's what mycoplasma bovis does to little calves. But... Um, this says in the marketing literature is that it's um, licensed for treatment of mycoplasma bovis associated with pyrexia. Okay, so does that just mean that's just for calves with pyrexia? Or is it that, I don't know what that means, but it's being very specific about what its licensing is for and what they have evidence about. Potentially, don't know. Just flick through the vet record. Um, this really upsets me. They're trying to make dogs look like cats. That's never going to happen, is it? As a feline vet, that upsets me. But um, what the suggestion might be here is that we've done something for cats. Why not do it for dogs too? Well, dogs are very different from cats. Do we need to do for dogs what we do for cats? You as a clinician, that is up to you. We have the availability, but it's down to you to make the decision and check that to yourself, I am making this decision for an evidence-based reason, for a Kit Kat reason, or for some other reason. One of my mates said, are you going to do any statistics in your talks? I need to learn that today. I said, no, go to Rich Evans's talk. He's doing more statistics by the look of him. But it's impossible to talk about um, people selling you things without having some of the facts. So I do and like statistics as part of my job. If you'd asked me that 10 years ago, I'd have told you you were the most ridiculous human being. But at that time, people were throwing statistics at me all of the time, and I just didn't get them. Or more to the point, I didn't get what the important ones were. So I could forget about all the clever stuff and just focus on the big things first. And then if I need to know more detail, I can go and look it up. So I'm really pleased reading Richard's abstract that he's going to talk about p-values today. Makes me a nerd, I realise. But everybody always worries about the p's, OK? Half the time, the p's that you see in material that's sent to you are just a pile of mush, really, OK? P-values are not everything. You can do lots of things with p's. You can serve them like that. You can cook them. You can mush them. It's exactly the same as a p-value, OK? Every single one of you right now could press some buttons on my computer with a little statistical package and create a p-value. Well done, you guys. It's not clever, OK? The clever bit is knowing when a p-value is important and when it's not, OK? You can do a study with three dogs in it and get a p-value that's significant. That doesn't mean the drug works or the test works or the idea works. It just means it's significant. Power is what's important, OK? I nearly put a picture of you. Mr. Fine, Dr. Viner up, and I'm glad I wasn't brave enough to do it. But power is the key. So what you need to do when somebody gives you something and says, look, it works, because it's got a p-value of less than 0.05, you should go, well, was there a power calculation or a sample size done before that study? Doesn't matter if you don't know what the words mean. That's the phrase you need to come out with <laughs> if you're going to beat them, OK? Whoever them is. It's not um, industry bashing at all. But what you're supposed to do when you do any type of study ever, not just about randomised controlled trials, is do a funny little calculation, which again, I could give you all my computer, not at the same time, it's quite a small computer, but you could all do it. I could tell you what numbers to push in, and you could create a sample size that would tell you to know the difference between, in this room, the number of people wearing red to the number of people wearing pink, and well, red and pink compared to the people that aren't, it would tell us we would need 350 people in this room. Half of them wearing pink or red, half of them not, and then we could probably do it. Because what a power or a sample size calculation says is if you get that number of people, animals, whatever, if you then get a p-value that's less than 0 0.05, you can believe it and be confident. OK, so if somebody gives you a study and says, yes, we did a randomised control trial, yes, it's about treatment, and it got a p-value of something, you can sagely turn to them and say, did you do a sample size calculation? <coughs> or a power calculation? Um, and then you are being an evidence-based person. If they say no, uh, or if they say yes, always ask them whether if they finished off with the same number of individuals that they started with. Because they do the statistics at the end, and you've got to keep the same number of animals in. If they say no, we need to wonder whether there was enough animals in the first place. 
Because what you need is enough animals to be able to see the, differ the real difference if it's there and not just do it due to chance. If I picked up four pieces of fruit, they would all be cherries, and I would think that bowl is completely full of cherries. But I didn't. I picked up six bits of fruit. I didn't. I nicked this off Google Images. But anyway, if you pick up six bits, you find your raspberry, and that's what you're trying to do. You need enough individuals to see the difference if it's truly, really there. And a power calculation is your route forward. That is your tip. Ask for it. We can have a little five minutes over a beer at some point, and I can actually explain what it means, the, the ins and outs of it if you want. But it's basically saying, is there enough animals that I can believe your p-value, whoever you are? Because absolute numbers matter. So how many animals were in the study? So sometimes we're shown that um, things like this. So we have a pie chart of percentages. What's good about this pie chart is that it tells me absolutely that there are 14 cases in there. So that's good. That's good evidence. It's telling me the number of animals. My question would be, if I was questioning whoever gave me this bit of information, would be, is that enough for me to be able to believe whatever it is that you're saying? Which brings me on to percentages. I hate percentages, okay? Nine out of 10 cats prefer whatever, doesn't matter. Well, nine out of 10 cats is good, 10% of cats is not good, because you need to know whether it's 37% of nothing, of, of what? Because it really, really does matter. So you will see lots of things like this. Again, this is from, it's sort of therapeutic stuff, but it applies also to diagnostic testing. So if we do, fancy screening in cats with asymptomatic heart murmurs, 20% of them live longer. Well, is that because you did that study on 300 cats or you did it on 30 cats? It really, really matters, um, the size of the study. So if, you, if you're given anything like this, whatever the subject matter is that's being sold to you, um, push it away and ask them how many animals were involved because that is really, really important. Hopefully you've already bypassed that by asking them the power calculation thing and they don't like you anymore like people at BSABA don't always like me. But so this is better, okay? There are only 14 cases in it, but at least I know it's clear, okay? I've taken off the snorkel and the headphones. I'm a bit clearer about what's going on here. Graphs, right? Probably I like or hate graphs less or more than I hate percentages. So this is a lovely graph because it's got cats all over it. Um, it's got purpley stuff. I really had to look at this to know what was going on. Um, and it's probably hard to see from where you are, but we're talking about the proportions of plaque, tartar, and, and gingivitis severity. And the cats like the purple thing, that's what it's about. So the purple is the diet that might help cats with their dental disease, that's what that graph is about. Um, but you can win an Apple Watch. Okay, so people in the room, I don't have one of those to talk with yet, so if you'd like to give me one, then that would be great. I can only hand out iPads. Um, but graphs are everywhere, and most of us who are scared of statistics can actually read a graph because we've all seen them before. Graph, if you're from down here. I'm saying graph. It's the same as a graph. Um, but you, you see them everywhere. I love them in the Daily Mail, perfect teaching material for students. If you're not sure how to do this with the veterinary literature, just buy the Daily Mail once a week and work your way through it and click on all the links and see what's going on in the world of, of our, our own health. Um, but graphs are everywhere and they're very good visual things. And if you're a visual person like I am, as you may have worked out from this talk by now because there's not been very many things to write down, um, they are a really good way of, com of conveying information. They're also a very good way of um, hoodwinking you. So that's where the title of this talk came from, was a graph that I gave to a student um, in some teaching. Now the basics, right? Can you see that? You don't have to see the numbers. Can you see this line and that line? And um, I've, it's like famous people's children. I've blanked out the subject matter, okay, with the gray box. The gray box doesn't mean anything. What this is, is a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. Ignore all those fancy words, okay? What you do, if you love them, they are brilliant set of statistics, but what it's saying is that there's some animals in this group and some animals in that group, and it's the probability of them living over time, okay? So there's um, days along the bottom and other stuff up the side, and what it's, as the lower this line comes down, the higher chance you are, have of not surviving, okay? If you stay nice and high, you, your probability of survival is high, so you stay up there. Now, does anybody see anything Possibly people on the front. Anything wrong with that graph? It doesn't go down to zero. It doesn't go down to zero. Teacher's pet. Okay. <laughs> Teacher's pet. It's in French. <laughs> it's in French. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes. I, I know what je means, though. That means yeah. days. I can manage that. That's given a half of it away. Look, it's in English now. Do you see the difference in the graphs? OK. Still highest chance of surviving is the big black line at the top. So these animals are still have a higher probability of living than these ones here. But this graph starts at 0 and goes to 1. This starts at 0.5 and goes to 1. Does anybody in the room start counting at 0.5? <laughs> no, I don't either. That would be far too complicated. I start at 0 and just keep going. And that's what I want to see on a graph. I want to see a decent scale that makes sense. Nobody starts counting from 0.5 to 1. We all start at 0 if we're trying to get to 1, or 0 if we're trying to get to 10 or 100. But do you see what it does if you alter that y-axis? Okay, there is a p-value here, the same p-value exists here, but it makes the difference look bigger. They are giving you good science, it, it, well, yeah, we can have beers over that one, but they are giving you the science, the core science, but they've done something to it. Understandably, it is their job and responsibility to sell something to you, it's your job and responsibility to give the best care to your patients. So, quite easily, um, you can look at this and go, what's wrong with the y-axis? doesn't matter that you don't understand a Kaplan myograph, you just know we start counting at naught. We do not start counting at 0.5. It just changes. It warps the way you look at graphs for the rest of your life. Okay? That's why some people like pie charts, because you can't leave bits out of a pie chart. Okay? Pie charts can get very complicated and they don't tell you enough sometimes. But just starting to fully understand the graph, because it's easy to make them look good, it's less easy to become criti uh, critical of them and have a look at some basic things. This is statistics. It's not complicated statistics, but it's really important. If they go, OK, yes, I see what you mean. Here's the actual paper, and let's talk through it now. You're dealing with somebody that's really, really good. <coughs> Which brings us to the evidence. So the amount of evidence that is in material that's given to us. There is some small print on here, but I haven't got my glasses on as to how good smart water is. But apparently it's smart because it comes from the clouds and then they distill it and then they add electrolytes. That's what makes it smart. And then it's smart because they made it that way, okay? Taste of water. Um, so sometimes we get evidence. Sometimes we get stuff to keep us going during that evidence. This is why I love the Kit Kat. Um, sometimes you can then also listen to expert opinion about that evidence. They'll even give you the headphones. I need the headphones back, whoever I gave them to. Um, you can win some headphones to listen to the webinar from the experts about the science, covering it from all angles. Um, and you can carry on eating your Kit Kat. This is the second Kit Kat that I ate. So there is quite a lot of support for this. I'm not saying the science is particularly good or bad, but there's quite a lot of support for that. And you as an individual, that's good, but then you have to wade through it. So you've got a bit of science, you could also read the paper, you've then got somebody's expert opinion listening with you in your earphones. You've still, you can critically appraise an expert's opinion as much as you can a bit of marketing material or a bit of pure science. But there's some options here. But as I said at the beginning, you need to question what's going on. If you get enough skills, you can then ask for the evidence and ask for the correct piece of evidence. But if you're new to this, That's the chairperson giving me the nod. This good, we're nearly on nine, I think. Or are we on 10? Um, if you're new to this, there is a great website called Sense About Science, okay? You can go on their website and everybody, somebody tries to tell you anything from smart water to um, a Kit Kat. If you're not sure of the evidence behind it, you can go online and say, I want to know the evidence about X. It gets put in their database. Okay, these are people, this is a, um, a charitable organization trying to get the world better at dealing with science. So we're better at dealing with our healthcare, we're better at dealing with what we eat. But you can do it for that, but you can also do it for veterinary medicine. There's an online postcard that you can do. So if you're not sure, you can go and ask somebody else. The best bit is finding their website, because <coughs> they, they have a public's approach um, to science, so it's a good way of educating your clients, yourselves, everything. But ask for it. The people that are selling you whatever it is should be able to give you some evidence. Somebody will then say to me, what's the evidence that evidence-based veterinary medicine makes practice better? I don't have that yet. Okay, they don't really have it in medicine, bits of it they do. You become more organized, you have more idea of what you're doing, is that better? My honest evidence-based answer as yet is I don't know, but I believe we have to make things better than they are at the moment. So you can check the evidence yourself, and that could be reading papers, and there is more and more help and more and more teaching around this. There are um, areas where people have read the papers for you, so if you're not aware of these, um, resources yet. Our CVS knowledge summaries are coming. We've got a resource called Best Bets for Vets and Vets Rev. It has 
critical appraisals of papers um, around very clinical um, situations where you can start to learn about the right types of evidence to answer the right types of questions and then also the kinds of things to look for. So in there it will always say, do the patients look like your patients? Um, are there enough of them? What are the p-values? Did they um, present whole numbers as well as percentages? It's all in there. You can start to learn the patter. This is one of my favourites. This phrase, clinically proven, does anybody in the room know what it means? I haven't really thought about it till this talk, so thank you for making me do this talk. This says it's clinically proven to reduce the buildup of plaque tartar and severity of gingivitis. So, I went to urbandictionary.com, second in my heart to Wikipedia. This is what clinically proven means according to them. It may mean virtually anything, including nothing. A clinically proven statement is advertising, in advertising is effective sales pitch, usually a vague claim that requires no hard evidence and it isn't easy to disprove. As long as the mandatory something about FDA and Americanness disclaimer is on the label, it's not necessary to have competent and reliable scientific evidence to back it up. I'm scared because there's somebody from NOAA in the room, but I tried NOAA's website and see if I could find what clinically proven did or didn't mean. But it's interesting and I hadn't thought about that before. So what you need to do is practice. There are lots of things coming up. I practice when I go to the doctors with my little boy. Really? What's the evidence for that? Is that a randomised control trial or was that a cohort study? Really? Is there a power calculation? Brilliant. Was their little boy, you know, white Caucasian, about two years old, always falling over and currently covered in bruises all of the time? Did your patients look like that? It's really good fun. Do it at a London vet show. Okay? Do it anywhere. Go out there and do it. There's stands everywhere. You can go and practice and see what happens. But practice does improve things. I didn't know any of this six years ago and it's got a lot better. Throughout, though, we need to keep some faith, okay? Um... We have our own responsibilities and we all have to accept that we have our own biases and you have those inside you before you even start reading something. And that's why it's important to keep an open mind but that needs to be critical and that keeps you as a sceptic, not a cynic. Um, but you also have to remember that other people have their own responsibilities and biases as well. So the responsibilities of a marketeer from a big pharmaceutical company is not to safeguard the health and welfare of animals in our care. That is not their job. That is our job. And it's our job to deal with this sales patter appropriately. So what I would say is keep drinking the smart stuff. Um, still keep eating the Kit Kats, take the iPads, go skiing, enjoy yourselves, work with industry, work with people that are selling you any kind of... Um, product or idea um, but keep the skills going and you'll get better at it um, and yeah find any better water than this and please send it to me in the post because I love a good bit of advertising gap so thanks all of you for coming I'm sorry it's warm in here is it me <sighs> Um, RCVS Knowledge for asking me to speak, my gang back at Nottingham, all of the vets' practices, I recognise some of them in the room, um, the owners and farmers that we work with, and for everybody that supported our research to date. If you want to follow us on Twitter, then please do. Um, we also have websites listed here, and I'll happily take questions, though I do have to clear my clutter up for the next speaker. Thank you. Questions? Um, you refer to an interesting mixture of licensed medicines, foods, uh, testing, and so on and so forth. Yeah. You make a reference to the impact or otherwise of a regulatory system and the testing or otherwise of products before they're ever put on the market. Yeah. What uh, score do you set to? Yeah, um, it's a really interesting debate. So I didn't focus on that because. Um, a lot of our work and the focus of today was on practitioners. So a lot of the work at the centre is when something's in your hand, what do you do with it? Because often once products or whatever get to the market, nobody, it's very difficult to get further stuff done. So pre-licensing stuff, some of the evidence that gets a drug to the point of it being licensed is still, can be, still be really poor. Um, it's, it meets the criteria of that regulating body, um, but it doesn't mean we always have really good powered big trials that would tell us that A is better than B. So they meet some of the regulations, but still if you look at some of the studies, we don't get to see all of them, so we don't see the whole evidence base. But they don't, um, 
the biggest test of any product is once lots of people start using it, and they've shown that well in medicine. So they have an evidence base to get lots of things regulated. There's been a massive push by Tom Jefferson and co in the medical profession to get the EMA to deliver all of the stuff that supports the licensing of a product. And I think we're going to follow that, which is good. But even once something is licensed or approved, or whatever the right word is, depending on whether we're talking about a test or a product, um, they have given enough science to satisfy the regulatory body and those regulatory bodies are good and we need them, that doesn't necessarily mean that evidence base is sound enough for you to change your practice and that's what you've got to get good at. Does that answer the question? Sort of, yeah. I mean, I get asked to do things sometimes for regulatory bodies. It's happening more and more and it's, it always really interests me because I don't know much about the drug development. It's working with our pharmaceutical partners. I learn more and more about what happens before a license occurs and sort of over the last 12 years of my career, I've had quite good contact with industry but still when we critically appraise those studies for a best bet or something it's still not the evidence often still isn't good enough for us to sit as a group of vets and go would I now change my practice and do I need to do that or am I just doing that because it's new and shiny we have to stick within the cascade people Martin it's interesting what level do, sorry to what level do you think drives <laughs> or acceptable I think I'm, it, I'm not necessarily thinking of here you're not thinking of FIFA, no. No, I'm thinking, yeah, no, I was going to be rude, but I won't be Martin. I'll be up with that afterwards. I think it depends on you, okay? I will eat the Kit Kat. That doesn't mean I'm bribed into doing it. I will, I had a lovely couple of days in Budapest recently for, from a company. Um, I was talking about some research, but there were lots of other people there that were just having a jolly, and I think that's nice, but I walked into the um, foyer of that hotel, and three people came up to me and said, I'm still not sure. I'm like, well, good. That means you're keeping an open, critical mind. So I think... The nice stuff is nice. I, wouldn't, I would hate us to get to the point where the pharmaceutical industry are not allowed to talk to us, which has happened in medicine. That would be awful. That would be a real bad step backwards because we have vets working in industry too and they are part of our profession and they are also in a place to help us be more evidence-based. But um, I, I think it's, it's people-specific. It's quite difficult, other than a shiny pair of sparkly shoes, to get me to buy something. Mm -hmm. But um, shoes is where you'd get me if you need me to buy something. Um, that doesn't mean that's what you have to do, people, to make me say what you want me to say. But um, I don't know. I don't think we know. But I do know that in medicine they've started to stop it. The pharmaceutical industry used to bring cigarettes for doctors. They're not allowed to do that. Would you like to buy this study? <laughs> it's mine. It's actually the University of Nottingham's property. Right. Um, I think that means if there's another question, I'm probably allowed. There's a gent here. I just have an observation. Yeah. Actually which is something rather murky in your bottle of smart water. Okay. And I just wondered whether another interpretation thinking about risk might have been that it causes mild discomfort on the way in or possibly the way out. <laughs> is why it's called smart. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> I'm going to can I use that in a talk. Um, this actually isn't the genuine article. I don't remember having difficulty when I drank the genuine stuff. But, um, yeah, I like that. I'm going to use that. That's another alternative to smart. Cool. Thanks very much for coming. Enjoy your day, people. We'll try and get some air in here. Thank you. Thank you.